Hello there, fight friends. Special treat today. You probably know the face on the screen already because if you're following my channel, that means you're a fan of Canadian mixed martial arts. And so you know that TJ Laramie is one of the top prospects in the country. TJ, thank you for speaking with us. Thank you for having me. Now, before we even get started, I'd like to offer you an apology. You're probably wondering to yourself, what's the apology for? What did he do? Well, the first time I ever actually met you in person was at the weigh-ins for uh, the last prospect, I think it's prospect uh, PFC number 16, where your brother was fighting, and I walked up and I called you Tony yeah. right away. And you looked at me like, uh, actually, uh, my name is TJ. <laughs> I'm like, I felt like such it's a dummy. It's okay. It happens a lot. <laughs> Even uh, the commentary in a lot of fights will get us mixed up. Yeah, okay. Well, you're obviously two, two very distinct individuals. But what you have in common is you're both amazing fighters. His last fight at PFC, he smashed his opponent. He did super great, and he was really, really fun to watch. Uh, you're similar to your brother in a lot of ways, but you are very different as well. Can you tell fight fans who might be new to you exactly who you are and, and what you are like as a fighter? So, yeah, you know, I, I've been a professional now for eight years. Um, uh, I like to be a little bit my, – my brother, I would say, is definitely a little bit more comfortable on the feet. He likes to stay on the – the feet, use the hands a little bit, even though he's got all the skills. And uh, me, I kind of like to take things <clears throat> to the ground, control it there. It's a little bit more controlled, you know, less risk, mm -hmm. higher reward for me. And it seems to have worked, although I do have fights where I've mainly stood the whole time as well. Are you the type of fighter who is able to figure out a game plan before a fight and stick to that game plan for the whole thing, even if it doesn't seem at the time like it's the right thing to do? Uh, yeah, definitely. I feel um, like I definitely like to watch opponents before I fight. Um, I know some people don't, but uh, just to get a, a general idea of what these people are better at, what they're not so mm -hmm. good at, um, I find that, you know, <clears throat> uh, being a complete fighter, um, I'm able to take the fight pretty much anywhere. So if a guy has, mm -hmm. I don't really think I've ever fought too many people with a grappling advantage, but if a guy is more of a grappling based fighter, I could easily keep it standing and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I first really became aware of you and your brother, mostly you probably, I'm going to say four, maybe five years ago when I had some, I'm going to call them spies, but that's kind of a joke. They were just people happened to be there. They were down at Duke Roofs' camp down the States, and they were telling me that you were there with the Pettis brothers, and you were you, the, the pair of you were just lighting the place up. I mean, you were really competitive. You just looked super impressive even back then. So tell me, you know, do you have any memories of that? And, and when was the first time you really realized that your skills could match up with those of other people who are competing at a high level? Um, so I would say my first ever exposure to, like, high-level uh, guys would be um, – some of Sam Stout's last fights in the UFC, uh, mm -hmm. I was able to be like a part of that and help him help train with them and stuff, spar with him, uh, as well as Chris Hordecki. Hordeck so like getting rounds in with those guys was probably my first exposure to like higher level guys and knowing that I could hang with someone like this and that this was a, a real life thing and uh, something I can make a career out of. And then, yeah, I found myself at Duke Rufus's a few times earlier in my career, and it was great, you know. Uh, I think the team's amazing. Uh, I think they work very hard, and I, uh, they're extremely nice, like very, very giving and more than happy to help. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, you've had a lot of success in your career, but probably, and you've been very vocal about this in the past on your social media, about how you had the opportunity in the UFC, you really dominated your Dana White's Contender Series fight. You look fantastic. And then things didn't really go your way. I mean, it happens to everybody, man. So what I'm really focusing on with a lot of my interviews these days, because fighters, I'm not going to say everything's known about the, the physicality of it because it's always evolving and people are always training. But what I'm always really interested in learning about is uh, the fighter's perspective when it comes to mental conditioning and mental strength training. I mean, I've just talked with a bunch of guys, Xavier Nash. I just finished with Adam Asenzo a while ago. And one thing they all seem to have in common is they really take that aspect of it very seriously where, you know, the brain is a muscle that you need to exercise as well. And if you want to be successful, you have to make sure that your brain is in the same level as your body. So I'm just sort of wondering, like, where you are with that when it comes to the mental preparation for a fight. Yeah, so I feel like that was probably my biggest fault when I was in the UFC. I never really felt like it was a lack of skill that I couldn't be there. But it was definitely a mental <clears throat> issue for sure. Um like a lot of anxiety and stuff. Uh, 
but I've been working with mental coach, uh, on and off since then. Um, and you know, it definitely helped like even just like little things, you know, to keep you zoned into the fight and zoned into your goal, you know, because being honest, like after my last UFC mm-hmm. fight, I thought I was going to be like, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm done with this shit. You know, I kind of like, I've already mm-hmm. been there. There's no, no point, you know, I've already had my opportunity, but, uh, you know, it's like when, uh, some keeps calling your name, you know, it's like, it, it's just hard to, hard to put it down, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. but like, like you, uh, said though, is we spend so much time physically working out in the gym, um, that the mental aspect needs to be exercised just as much as the physical, if not mm-hmm. more. Like, <clears throat> I think, uh, watching one of Faraz Zahabi's videos, he said it best is that, <clears throat> Um, like training is like 90% physical and then 10% mental. But when it comes down to fight night, it's 99% mental because at that point Mm -hmm. there's no more training to be done. Your physicality is what it is. It all comes down to what's up here. Right. So like, yeah. uh, Yeah. So the physicality uh, is no longer when it comes to fight night, of course, like everything you put into training uh, is still there, but, uh, mm-hmm. the mental is what's going to bring all of that out. hundred percent. So I'd like to t- touch later about UFC 289 more in depth, but just right now, just a brief point. If you saw that, uh, Mike Malott, he had uh, an excellent win at UFC 289 mm-hmm. immediately after he was very vocal talking about how his mental coach, Danny Patterson made such a big difference. And you saw like he was laser focused. Mike was walking out and that barricade fell down. All those people fell down. Like, cut a foot over and they might have taken him out and stopped him from fighting but it's like he didn't even notice it happened he just powered right through it and i think that kind of that one track mind focus is probably something that a a fighter at your level needs to have no exactly like uh it it is really the most important thing like because even if you have uh say not the best training camp for whatever reason that may be if you're strong up here mentally like we guys at this level have been doing this so long your skills are still there. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? You just have to believe in that. You have to trust that and it's going to come out in the fight, but that all comes down to what's up in your head. Now, I don't know you personally. I I know you as, as a fighter. So I'm just like any other fan that watches you on, on different platforms. One thing I absolutely love about you, TJ, is your, is your hustle when it comes to fighting grappling tournaments and just going out there. It seems like every week or every couple of weeks I'm going online. I thought, Ooh, he did another competition this weekend and you're really doing really well. How important is that to you? And like, why do you make sure that you keep that competitive nature going even when you're not inside a cage? So when I started my professional career, I kind of sat back on all that. and I didn't really compete in grappling for like six, seven years, maybe a little bit more before, uh, before this last year and then this last year once I got cut from the UFC uh the big thing I didn't like about being in the UFC was just my lack of competition you know as far as like Mm -hmm. uh how active you are so keep keeping that competitive nature and then like having something to work for having something to train for that's like really what I wanted and more like I said uh going back to the mental aspect it's a very low risk high reward way to train my mental uh, exposing yeah, myself yeah. to competition all the time. Well, that's great that you're able to find this outlet because I think a, a lot more fighters could probably follow suit with what you're doing, and I think that might be beneficial to them. Yeah, absolutely. Like even before I went pro in MMA, I've had as a, as a teenager, you know, hundreds of grappling matches, and uh, mm-hmm. like I'd be lying if I said that didn't set me up to be successful in my pro career. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on to this weekend at uh, BTC 20, Night of Champions in Niagara Falls. You're fighting a guy, and let me take uh, my eyes off the screen so I can read his name. It is Neftali Martinez Burgos. Maybe not the Burgos you'd want to fight, but a Burgos nonetheless. Tell me what you've known about this guy, if you've done any research, and take a look and tell me what you think. So this fight really only got put together about two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago. Um, um, I know that he's primarily a striker, uh, hasn't really fought like extensive competition um he's moving up from 135 to fight me as well he's a little bit taller lankier so i think the obvious answer for success uh is take it to the ground but i don't really feel like even on the feet he's really going to be able to handle like anything i'm bringing with this yeah 
Tell me about the preparations for not even necessarily this fight, but any fight. Do you do how much of the preparation and the game planning is done by you and how much is it done by your team? And would you mind just talking about who your coaches are in your team at, in Windsor and, and, and how this all comes together for you? So, yeah, I mean, uh, primarily the last year, like uh, you mentioned before, was uh, I've been just grappling over in uh, Ohio at Adam S. Jiu-Jitsu. Um, so I've been teaching and training over there a lot, um, working with those guys. And then obviously MTC Windsor. Like I, I train at so many different gyms, you know, like there's so many people part of the success. It's uh, like Michigan Top Team, Murcielago MMA, uh been training at BTC a lot down here as well as uh, occasionally at Niagara top team and Aegis. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as far as game plan works, I feel like one thing I've always been uh, pretty high on uh, is a good fight IQ throughout my whole career. You know, mm -hmm. I'm pretty successful at taking guys to where they're not the greatest. And uh, my whole career has been against pretty, even from, Early on, you know, I've always wanted to fight the best guys. I've always had tough fights. Uh, never really looked to, like, build my record necessarily, which, honestly, if I were to go back, mm -hmm. I probably would have done it the opposite because I'm still only 25 and I've already been to where I am, um, where yeah. I've been, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, everybody has a, a piece a piece of, uh, like, credit for my success, for sure. There's just so many people. I find that that's happening more and more lately is that well, I just, like I mentioned, I was on the line with Asenza and he talked about his sort of circles of the different gyms he, gyms he travels to. And you've got something similar. It sounds like so, there's some overlap in your gyms, but you also do some training in the States. It used to be years ago that was unheard of how a fighter, they'd be uh, fighting in their own team, their own gym. They wouldn't even let other people see them train. Uh, but that's really evolved over time. So tell me, like... It, and, you're, you're, and you, you just said it, you're, just, you're 25 years old, which to me is absolutely crazy that you've accomplished this much at this age. How, is this normal to you? Is this normal to fighters of your generation? Or are you, were you even aware that back in the day, this is something that they would not do? Uh, I mean, for me personally, I've always been somebody that's always trying to find like, who's the best at this? Who's the best at this? Mm -hmm. Where can I get new looks? You know, I've never really been someone to stick in the same spot. Uh, I don't really like to, I don't, like, I don't want to be closed minded in that sense, you know, um, mm -hmm. if it comes down the line where, you know, I end up fighting somebody I train with, then so be it. But at the end of the yeah. day, if I can benefit from you, you can benefit from me, then we're all getting better. That's fine. You know, I don't really feel yeah. like I need to, like, hide anything. If you want to go watch my fights and see what I do, you can do this, you know. Mm hmm. Okay, well, let's, let's finish off the interview with something I can't avoid, and I have to bring it up because we just had an incredible fight weekend in Canada, UFC 289 Vancouver. We had uh, five plus one Canadians, and I say that because Diana Belvica is uh, an honorary Canadian. They all won their fights, which was absolutely incredible. Tell me about your night, your Saturday night. Did you watch the fights, and what did you think? Yeah, I watched, uh, definitely watched the fights. All the fights were impressive. You know, Canada went undefeated, uh, mostly finishes too. Um, so it was, it was great to see. I felt like everybody, you know, Canadian MMA is definitely around, uh, mm -hmm. and they're here to stay. I mean, we only got 16 Canadians in the UFC total out of like, like six, 700 athletes, which is pretty amazing to know that six out of the 16 of them, uh, just won in one card. So yeah. it's pretty yeah. cool to know that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I felt like everybody <laughs> really proved that Canadian MMA is here to stay and it's not going anywhere any, anytime soon. Did you have any special moment that stood out to you from the weekend from, from UFC? Uh, I will say Mike Malott's performance was definitely yeah. by, by far, like, it was honestly flawless overall. Like, uh, yeah. just the way he was, <clears throat> you could see, this is where we go back to the mental, it was like, you could see everything was, like, moving in slow motion for this guy, whether it was he was getting high kicks thrown at him and swaying from the kick or whether it was grappling. It was like, he was just reading his opponent so well. Um, and no matter where the fight went, he was in control all the way to the finish. Mm -hmm. So it was, that, yeah. that was by far for me, the most uh, impressive thing to see. It, it was for me as well. And there's just levels to that. Cause I mean, once again, that was his 10th fight, 10th, uh, stoppage in the first round. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. This guy's almost un unstoppable. He's a, he's a good role model. No, exactly. Yeah. And he's a nice guy in real life too. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I was very happy to see that win. 
Okay, TJ, I could, I feel like I could probably sit down over a beverage with you and chat for like two or three hours, but this is an interview, so we're just going to stick it and leave it here. Uh, before we go there, is there anything you would like to add, anyone you'd like to thank? I'd just like to thank everybody who's helped me train for this fight, you know, uh, and tune in on June 17th. I'm not sure if there's a live stream anywhere, but if not, get your tickets at Burlington Training Center. Awesome. So I, I'm going to let you go now, but before you hang up, just stick on the line. We're going to chat briefly after we're done, okay? Okay. Okay, well, TJ Laramie, thank you so much. Fighting at BTC 20, Night of Champions, this Saturday night, Niagara Falls. Fans, if you're watching, TJ is an absolutely thrilling fighter to watch. If you can, I encourage you to go in live in person. There's still tickets left. And I will have the link to the pay-per-view or, or whatever the streaming format's going to be at MMA.ca on the BTC 20 page. So check that out if you want to watch it. Thanks a lot.